Last week we ended up at, they were, Jesus and his disciples were at the uh, city of Cana. Jesus had just uh, turned the, the, wa- the six firkins of water, the, uh, the uh, 36 firkins of water, all those gallons of water into wine. Very good grape juice. And uh, amazed everybody that was there. And we, that was the first of his miracles. And again, what we're, do- what we're looking at right now during this, seri- this particular series is his first year of ministry. And there's a lot of firsts in this first year of ministry, as one would expect there to be. That was his first miracle ever after his baptism. And now, in verse 13, we read this. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, Take those things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. So, this is his first appearance in Jerusalem, and it is quite an appearance. He shows up, and the first thing he does is chase everybody out of the temple that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, now, there's, there's actually two times when Jesus chases people out of the temple. This is the first one. There's another one later on in his ministry, towards the end, before he gets crucified. But what's going on here? He's been in Cana, which is up in the north. It's near Nazareth. And he goes down into Jerusalem. And, well, he goes there for a particular reason. In verse 13, it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. All Jewish males in Israel were supposed to spend Passover. They would go up to Jerusalem to spend Passover. They wouldn't spend it in their hometowns unless they simply could not get to Jerusalem. So, the normal function, three times a year, but particularly in Passover, they would go to Jerusalem. So Jesus is going to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. He's supposed to be there. And when he gets there, he notices something. He notices that at the temple, there are merchants and money changers who are busy selling and buying and taking care of business. And the problem here is that that what they had done was at Passover particularly, but at other festivals and generally throughout the whole year, the priests and these merchants had set up a racket. That racket had to do with making money off of religion. The animal merchants who were there, they were, these were men, and perhaps women, but g- generally men, people who would come, they would set up in, in, around the temple. And this had been going on since the time of the, of, the, of, the, of the building of the second temple, possibly even during the first temple. But people would come to Jerusalem for Passover and for other things. Uh, and they would come with their own lambs. Passover was a time when they would sacrifice a lamb, then they would roast it, and they would eat it. That was, you know, the, the celebrating of what, what God had done for them in getting out of Egypt. They were supposed to eat the Passover every year. And so people would come from all over Israel with their own lambs. But they had to eat a lamb that was unblemished, had no marks and, and other things on it. So uh, since, well, over in Exodus 12.5, it talks about how they needed to have this. If you want to turn over there quickly, Exodus 12.5. The story of the Passover. Beginning in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this is in Exodus 12, verse 1, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to the house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count, make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the, of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And it goes on and talks about that the blood would be smeared on the doorpost, and then they would eat the lamb. But it had to be unblemished. And that is the catch that these animal merchants saw as valuable. Because the Jewish leadership would require all people to have their lambs inspected before they would offer them up for the Passover dinner, okay? They had to be inspected by a temple inspector, a priest or a Levite who would inspect it for blemishes. And without exception, they would find some blemish in the lamb and the person would have to buy a new lamb from the animal merchants. As the inspectors would fail the lambs, they would send them over to an animal merchant who would sell them a new lamb and kickbacks would go to the inspectors. 
for having failed the lamps. So everybody's getting a cut of the action, and the people are none the wiser. Well, they, they are, they're catching on that everybody fails, so they're obviously um, either Israelites can't figure out what an unblemished lamb looks like, or the inspectors are a bunch of crooks. And that's what it came down to. They were ripping the people off at what was supposed to be a glorious day, remembering how God had saved his people out of Egypt. Turning it into, you know, just another holiday. Just another, just another day of business. But then the money changers, they're an interesting bunch. Um, in the Old Testament, transactions that were done for religious purposes with money involved had to be done according to what was known as the shekel of the sanctuary. Jewish money in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, their money, the shekel was set according to a particular price, the value of a particular silver shekel, and that was set by the high priest. And that was the value of money in Israel at this time. Okay? And all transactions uh, paying for, you know, for, uh, for uh, when they'd offer for sin offerings, they'd have to pay something sometimes, and, and, or they'd have to redeem a, a newborn child or something like that. They'd have to pay it according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Now, they would have to pay something at Passover. Uh, if they're buying this lamb, they would have to buy it with the, the, the sanctuary shekel, the official money of the temple. And if they're coming from some place where they have different currency, like they're using Roman coins or something else, they show up here, they have to exchange their money into a temple shekel. And when they do that, they go to a money changer who gives them a shekel in exchange for their money and then charges them a percentage. If you've ever had to exchange money going to another country, you'll see there's a percentage added on as, as that the, that the, person, that the, the person making the exchange takes. And so these money changers were making money exchanging for what was a required type of coin that was needed for carrying on business in the temple. So the animal merchants are making money off of bogus blemishes on, on lambs. The money changers are making money in forcing you to buy the temple shekel to be able to do exchanges. Everybody's getting rich off of this. There was supposed to be a time of celebration before the Lord for what he's done for them. Now, in verse 15, it says, And when he, Jesus, had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. One man with a scourge of cords. He took several cords, bound them together, and he's whipping people and chasing out the oxen and getting people. He cleared all of them by himself out of the temple. Just imagine, one, the strength of character, but also the agility and the, and the strength he had and the speed he had to be able to do this, to get these people to leave. Now understand, they were entrenched and they were certified by the priests to be doing this. So they had the authority of the temple behind them, but yet Jesus was able to chase them all out, along with their animals, overthrow their tables, and then in verse 16, and said unto them that sold doves, the, the lowliest form of sacrifice, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. He not only has this, this, this power to kick them all out, but then he makes that remarkable statement, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Anybody who heard him say that would be thinking, who does this guy think he is? Make not my father's house? This is Jehovah's temple. My father? Now, if you turn over to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. In John 2, 17, says this, And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten, eaten me up. They remembered this while it was going on. They saw Jesus going nuts on these, these merchants. And then telling them, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Just he, It was quite impressive to his disciples. But they remembered this, That the zeal of my house, thy house hath eaten me up. They were quoting Psalm chapter 69, beginning in verse 1. We read this. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. 
I seek in, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I, which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and am an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Now, you might be saying, well, how does this relate to Christ? Why would they be thinking of this verse? Particularly that in the first eight verses, he's talking about his own sins and his own failings. And we know Christ was not a sinner. So how does verse 9 relate? Well, apparently, the disciples were applying this statement to Jesus uh, at the time of this cleansing because this was considered, verse 9, particularly verse, you know, verse 8 and 9, or verse, uh, verse 9 and, yeah, verse 9, was considered by the Jewish rabbis to be a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Now, how they got that, I'm not exactly sure. I don't read Hebrew that well. I haven't read the, the Talmud and all that. But apparently they thought this was somehow relating to Messiah and that when he would come to his temple, the zeal of the house would, would, would cause him, you know, he, it would eat him up. It would it'd devour him. And that's what they're remembering, that they'd been taught this. The disciples had been taught this at some point when they were growing up. And so they saw this as relating to him and they, they realized that this is Messiah. Now, in verse 18... The Jewish leadership was not going to let this stand. Who is this Yahoo from Galilee coming in here, whipping out all all, 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 whipping out our uh, our uh, our, uh, money supply here, and telling us that uh, his father's house is being made a house of merchandise? So in verse eighteen in John two, We read this. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Now, it sounds as if, and this is what's really strange, it sounds as if the Jews would be willing to accept what Jesus did if he could show to them a sign to prove to them that God was behind this. You're saying, make my father's house a house of merchandise. Okay, show us a sign from God that you had the right to say that, that you have the right to chase these people out. In verse 19, Jesus makes this remarkable statement. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But, of course, he spake of the temple of his body. Now, understand, they were asking for a sign, and he gave them a sign. You destroy this temple, and I'll raise it back up in three days. Now, we know, of course, that Jesus was talking about dying on the cross and rising after three days, but the Jews would have taken it very literally. And they were thinking, now that would be a sign. Let's face it. One man rebuilding the entire temple in three days after it had taken 46 years of lots of labor to put it up? Yeah, that would have been a sign. And they're really doubting this. And, and you know, as, as well, you, you would be that way. They have to see it to believe it, as Jews always do. But according to verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. Now, he had said it, like many times his parables and other things that he said to the Jews, he said to people that were not believing, he was saying it to provoke them, to get them to think. And if they weren't going to believe, they would, you know, they, they'd miss the point entirely. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 13 with his parables. So saying this to them would have been quite a sign, which of course did take place, but not in a literal sense. And his disciples were the ones who understood it after the fact just like they understood everything about him. Turn, if you would, over to Luke 24. 
And I think it's very possible that he didn't, they didn't really understand this until after he was raised, raised from the dead. Like it says there. But in, verse, in, in Luke 24, beginning in verse 44, we read this. Jesus has appeared to them. This is um, either the, the, the night after his resurrection, that day, or a few days later. Uh, he appears to them, and he says this. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And they understood then how all the prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in him after his resurrection. So, the scourging, one, cleansed out the temple, but it also announced, I am my father's son, and I am going to destroy this temple and build it up again in three days. Or this temple will be destroyed by you, and in three days I'll raise it back up again. He's laying down all the groundwork for what's going to happen three years later when they crucify him, and he rises from the dead. Laying the seeds for what's about to happen. In verse 23, a little coda here on this. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Well, turn a couple passages here in John. I want to show you something. It says there in verse 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So they're seeing these miracles, and it was more than just this. There were other miracles he was doing, apparently, at this time while he was in Jerusalem. The one in Cana was the first, but there's other. Many miracles are going on here. Over in chapter 1, I want you to see this. John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So believing on his name is what makes you a son of God. Then if you would, jump over to John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. That he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So to believe in the name of Christ removes you from condemnation. Then if you would... John 20, verse 31. Conclusion to the gospel. But these are written, that is the word, the stories about Christ. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So, through or in the name of Christ, you have eternal life. Then, if you would... uh, over also to Acts 8.12. I'm going through all these for a, for a reason. Unlike most of the time, I do a lot of things for no reason, but this I'm doing for a reason. Acts 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's the first Samaritan convert's after Pentecost, they believed on the name of Jesus Christ and were saved. Then Acts 10.43. And this is, this is uh, Peter preaching to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. To him, that is Jesus, gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So if you believe in him and in his name, you'll have remission of sins. And then jump all the way over to 1 John. Just two more passages. And these are the only verses that talk about believing in him or his name. Okay? Believing in his name. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. John talking to believers that they are to believe on his name and then 
love one another. What Christians should be doing because they believed on his name. And then also last one, John 5, 1 John 5, 13, page or two over. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So believing on the name of the Son of God gets you eternal life, but is also the basis upon which you live the abundant Christian life. So believing on his name makes you what? It makes you a Christian. So back over to John chapter 2. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So he's doing these miracles and people are believing on his name. Believing on his name, as we saw in every other occurrence of that phrase, means that they got saved. Okay? But then this remarkable statement. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. They believed on his name. Now, it may have been a shallow faith because it was based upon miracles, but it said they believed on his name. How much do you have to believe to be saved? You just need to believe. There's no quantity. It's an act. You believe on his name, you're born again. These people are born again by what they saw. But Jesus would not commit himself to them. What does that mean anyway? Well, it says that he knew man was untrustworthy. He knew all men, and he didn't need anybody to tell him about mankind because he knew what was in man. What is in man? In every single human being ever born other than Christ is this in nature a thing that makes us enemies of God. Believing in Him makes us friends of God, makes us children of God, but it does not remove that sin nature. And so Christ still could not commit Himself to them. Now, you might be saying, well, what does that mean for us? Is He not committing Himself to us? At this time, the Holy Spirit was not indwelling people. Christ was still living on earth as a man, And he could not commit himself to them the way he commits himself to us now after the resurrection. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells inside us, seals us, so that we can, unto the day of redemption, have eternal life. Okay? These people had trusted in Christ, but he still did not have faith in them. And honestly, does he still have does he have faith in us today? I honestly don't think so. He has faith in the Holy Spirit working in us. But does God really trust us? What is it that saves us? Is it our own good works? Is it our own trustworthiness? No. It's our admitting that we are sinners, that we cannot save ourselves and letting him do the work. God does not need us. This is sometimes a hard thing to understand. God does not need us. We decided against him, turned on him. He does not need us. However, He wants us. He loves us and wants us to come back. But the only way we can do that is to trust in his name. Now, what is he going to do once we've trusted in his name? He's going to do everything in his power. That's a lot of power. To make us the image of his son. He's going to give us every advantage through the power of his Holy Spirit. But he never does really trust us until he's made us sinless. Once we are in heaven, once sin has been eradicated out of us, then we are his, and he is ours, completely and fully. But as long as we're here, we need to trust in what he is doing in us and rely on the power of his Holy Spirit because, folks, we're really not trustworthy. I know myself. What goes on inside of me is not a good thing. I'm a sinner still. It has to be God doing the work in me. Otherwise, there's no good thing in me at any point. That's why these words were said. Jesus knew what was going on in these people, even though they trusted in him and trusted in his name. He knew something else had to go on because they were not worthy of his commitment at this point. Okay? Now, um, that leads us to chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, when does this take place? Well, we assume immediately after this, probably in the evening, because we'll see here that this took place at night. 
It was probably near Jerusalem also that he met Nicodemus, because Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, as we'll see here. Um, we just read, which means that he was several things. First of all, it says that he was a Pharisee, the most conservative religious party in Israel. Um, and as a Jew, he viewed miracles as the signs confirming that God was with a teacher. John chapter 6, verse 30, makes this very interesting statement. This is the Jews coming to Jesus. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou work? These are the Jews coming to him. This is, he'd, he'd fed... Um, they were coming seeking, seeking bread from him. And they wanted to know what sign he would show to them to prove that he really was who he claimed to be. The Jews always sought signs to see that God was, was stamping his approval on things. Now... Nicodemus knew that God had promised Israel an everlasting kingdom with David's descendant, the Messiah, on the throne. Daniel 2 talks about that, as does 2 Samuel 7, the the, uh, place where David is given the promise of an eternal throne. While Gentiles would be in Messiah's kingdom, Nicodemus believed it was primarily for God's chosen people, the Jews. In other words, the kingdom was theirs. Messiah would rule over his people, Israel, and from there he would rule Israel the whole world. But Israel would be the focus of his his primary attention. Since it was also going to be a kingdom of righteousness, according to what the prophets taught, Nicodemus believed that obeying the Mosaic law would not only get him a place in the kingdom, but also a good position. So, just to summarize all of what I just said here, Nicodemus, being a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews and a devout man, but not a Christian at this point, believed that as a Jew, and as a righteous Jew, obeying the law scrupulously as a Pharisee, that he had a place in the coming kingdom of Messiah. Possibly a prominent place, because he was a ruler of the Jews. And so, he was coming to Jesus to talk to this teacher who was preaching righteousness. But he was teaching it in such a way that it was overwhelming people with the power and the majesty of his words. So he wanted to meet this guy. Verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus had been doing miracles. He did the one in Cana, but then he's apparently been doing miracles during his time here in Jerusalem. And had already started polarizing Jewish opinion at the temple. They're starting to see. And that that polarization was causing divisions. Some saw him as a teacher come from God. And others did not. Um, In fact, Jesus said this very thing over in Luke 12, 51. He said, you think I've come to bring peace. I'm not come to bring peace. I've come to bring division. I'm going to divide households and families between believing and not believing in me. I am come to cause division between people, those who will trust in me and listen to me and those who will not. Nicodemus is coming and telling him, look, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No, he says, we know. Who's this we he's talking about? Uh, Well, it's hard to say. Apparently there's other people that are understanding this. But turn, if you would, over to John chapter 7. Beginning in verse 40. In verse 37, this is during one of the feasts that Jesus is in Jerusalem. Um, uh, Verse 37, he says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, and out of the seed of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him, that is, take him to arrest him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, said that, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered, 
them the Pharisees, are, we also, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Well, yeah, they had, obviously. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, the same Nicodemus, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know not what he doeth? They answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee riseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. This is a year or so later. He is causing some serious division among the Jews. Okay? Now, Nicodemus would have known this. And when he tells them, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, we know right away what side he is taking. He's seeing Christ as somebody who's doing amazing things. But I think he's also intrigued to find out, why are my brethren in the Sanhedrin having these problems with him? We know that he's a teacher come from God. Now, uh, it also says that he came by night, okay? He would have come by night for a couple of reasons. First, he may have been afraid of Jesus' enemies on the Sanhedrin, as others were. Why would he be afraid? Well, because he's a member of the Sanhedrin. And one thing about the Pharisees and the people on the Sanhedrin, they were really judgy. If you were out of line in any way, you would be taken to task. You could lose your position and your place. And that could be very costly to your reputation and to your pocketbook. And so he was being very careful because he knew what it would be like. It would be explosive for to get out that he was thinking about believing in this teacher. He may have wanted to make sure also that he had an opportunity to meet Jesus privately because, well, crowds were already forming around Christ because of the miracles and the things he was saying. But there wouldn't be that many people at night. So he shows up around midnight. He's got a chance to talk to Jesus alone. Also, it's very possible he didn't want to embarrass himself as one of the chief rabbis, one of the chief rabbis being seen asking him questions because being one of the chief rabbis, he was supposed to know the law. And if he's asking Jesus questions, it would suggest that he doesn't know what he's supposed to know. And it would diminish his position, his authority. Nicodemus wants to know Jesus, wants to, wants to get to know this man, and get, show his respect at the very least. But he also knows that he's got to watch his own reputation. So that's why he came by night and he's doing what he's doing. Now, like most of the Jews of his day, Nicodemus had questions about the coming messianic kingdom. It was known that it would be an eternal kingdom. It was also known to be a Jewish kingdom with David's heir on the throne and with Israel restored to its former glory. That's what all the Old Testament prophets talked about. The, what we know as the, they're talking about the millennial kingdom. That's what they were talking about. In fact, over in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' disciples, just prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven, made this rather remarkable statement. Jesus has risen from the dead. It's 40 days later. He's getting ready to rise. When they therefore, verse 6 of Acts chapter 1, when they therefore, that is the disciples, the 11 disciples were gathered, come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he goes on and says, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be, my witness, be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and on the uttermost parts of the earth. And then he ascends up into heaven. The first thing out of their mouths as they're meeting for, with him for the last time is, are you going to establish your kingdom now? This kingdom we've been waiting for that Nicodemus was asking about? That, that, are you going to reign over us now? And he said, it's not time for you to know that yet. You're supposed to be my witnesses first. And then, of course, Pentecost comes and they start building churches all over the place. The kingdom had not yet come. Jesus' wording, or rather, um, let's see. Now, th this would have been the direction also of Nicodemus' conversation with him when he talks to Jesus. And that's what happens next in verses 3 through 21. Uh, beginning in verse 3, John 3, Jesus answered and said, after he told him that we know that you're a teacher come from God because no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus' wording here was something new, and it was meant to provoke an action. Nicodemus 
was not being sarcastic when he, when he answers Jesus. Brother, Jesus is telling him, Nicodemus hadn't brought up the kingdom, but Jesus said, look, Nicodemus, unless you're, unless you're born again, unless, um, what's the exact wording? Verily I says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was sure that he would see the kingdom. Why? Because he is a ruler of the Jews. He's a Pharisee. He's obedient to the law. He gets right to the crux of Nicodemus' issue. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. And Nicodemus incredulously says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother? He's not being sarcastic. He's saying, what do you mean, born again? He thinks he's in the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, you can't be there unless you're born again. And Nicodemus is saying, I don't even know what this born again is. If I need this to be in the kingdom, then I obviously must get a hold of this. Jesus answered Nicodemus' words, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus' explanation is rooted in something called the New Covenant. It's mentioned twice in the Old Testament. I'd like you to turn, if you would, over to Jeremiah chapter 31. This is something that Nicodemus would have known really well. Jeremiah 31. It's part of the promises of the coming kingdom. But his understanding of it would have been, well, obviously a little faulty. Jeremiah chapter 31 Beginning in verse 31, we read this statement. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no man, no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is what Jesus is referring to through verses 5 through 9. This new covenant would put the law into the inward parts and into the hearts of Israel. This new covenant, God will be their God and they will be his people. Every one of them will know him personally. They won't have to be exhorted to know him because they will know him personally. And also, he will forgive their sins and he will never remember their sins. Now, doesn't that sound like being saved? That's exactly what it is. Ezekiel has seven other promises along the same lines. The point is that this is something that Jews knew would be coming, and it was part of the kingdom. They would have a new heart. They would be born again. But yet Nicodemus, a teacher in Israel, did not understand this. So Jesus explains it to him in verses 5 and 6. I say say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born of water? Well, I personally think it's referring to physical birth. There are some that suggest that it's referring to the Word of God. Um, It it can, one one or the other. I personally think, again, it's, it's physical birth. It certainly does not refer to baptism, okay? Because nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say baptism saves you. But then you're supposed to be born of water, physical birth, and then born of the Spirit. That was Nicodemus' sticking point because being born a Jew in his mind was enough. I am one of God's chosen people. Being chosen, I'm in the kingdom. But Jesus is telling him, no, that's not enough. You have to be born a second time. Not just Jewish, but something else. Born again, according to verses 7 and 8, means to be born of the Spirit. And while men can see the evidence of the Spirit... They cannot see the fact of it. They don't know the Spirit is indwelling you if you're born again. But they see the evidence because you do things that only a Christian would do. Now, Nicodemus 
asks the question, how can these things be? He hadn't put the pieces together. The law was not yet written on his heart. His sin had not yet been taken away. Um, The law could not do that. The law made them guilty. The law did not make them righteous. And so as an obedient Jew, he could not see the law written on his heart. He would see the law as an obstacle that had to be overcome. So Jesus, however, will not let him off the hook. Verse 10, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So what all is going on here? Well, he's telling him, look, you don't know these things, but we've been testifying them to you. Now, he says we. Who's he referring to? Probably John the Baptist. Probably the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Certainly the father at his baptism. But the fact is, it wasn't just Jesus' opinion. There's plenty of testimony behind it that they've been telling him about this stuff and he hasn't been listening. What they had known, the scriptures had been teaching, and he had the scriptures, so he should have seen this. He had refused to see any of it. That's why he didn't understand this born-again stuff. Jesus says, if we taught you earthly things and you didn't believe them, How will you understand if I tell you these heavenly truths? You couldn't grasp what the Old Testament said. How are you going to see what I'm saying? And then he points out to him, look, this is just like it was with the serpent in the wilderness. I am speaking from my Father in heaven because I am with my Father in heaven. He's pointing out that he is omnipresent at this time, even though he's standing there in front of him. He says, my Father... I'm with my Father in heaven at this point. But then he tells him, look, you know the story in Numbers 21. There was a plague of fiery serpents that were killing the people left and right because of their disobedience. Moses made, at God's command, a brass serpent, put it on a pole, and held it up in the air. And anybody who looked to that that brass serpent on the pole was saved from dying. He said, in the same way, The Son of Man will be lifted up so that anybody who looks at him will be saved. That's what I mean by born again. You know about the serpent in the wilderness, now know about the Son. If you look on, well, he doesn't say me, he just says the Son of Man. If you look on him, when he's raised up, you will be saved. Jesus goes on to say, look, the reason we're doing this is that God so loved the world. That by itself probably would have shaken Nicodemus up because he's thinking Israel. God wants to save Israel, but he's saying, no, no, I'm here to save the whole world. Anybody who looks on the Son of Man when he's lifted up will be saved. And Nicodemus, consequently, is brought to a point of decision. If you believe, you'll be saved. If you do not believe, you will stay condemned. The law isn't going to do it. Only faith in the Son of God is going to do it. And it doesn't tell us what the result is. All we know is that from this point, Jesus and his disciples move on. 
But apparently Nicodemus did get saved because later on, well, he stands up for Christ in the Sanhedrin there in chapter 7, and we see in another gospel that he helps Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus after the crucifixion. He apparently had become a disciple, but again, so often he did it for fear of the Jews, he had to do it secretly, as Joseph did, until Pentecost when they became bold witnesses. But I guess the whole point of the story is that this ruler of the Jews who saw something in Jesus came to realize that what he had, what he thought he had, was just not enough. He had to turn to Christ, had to be born again, not just born a Jew. Um, And I hope you are born again this morning. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these two stories. We ask that you would cement what we've seen this morning to us so that we could take it and grow in grace from it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ten minutes till morning service.